All right, let's get started. Let's, let's pray. Father, we thank you for this morning and the opportunity to jump back into our study of the book of Romans. Please bless and guide us as we understand the world in which Paul lived and his mission of being an apostle for Jesus. We ask it in his name. Amen. Amen. All right, so we were in uh, the section still doing the introduction and getting the background of the book before we jump into the text itself. So we had ended with about the author, about Paul. If you recall, he was very well educated in Tarsus. It was a uh, Tarsus. It was a very recognizable city, city known for its high education standards, its culture, its arts, things like that. It was a major crossroads uh, of the Roman Empire, very wealthy, very well respected. Paul grew up in a fairly wealthy household, evidently, because not only did, the edu- did he get an education as a young man in Tarsus, but his father sent him to Jerusalem to study under one of the masters. There are two schools of thought, uh, Shammai and Hillel, and, and Gamal, whom Paul set at his feet, was the grandson of Hillel. So he's studying you know, the direct descendant, if you will. He's a, he's a student of a rabbi. He is there in the midst of the upper class of Jerusalem. He, he didn't just show up on the scene one day and, and receive the status that he had because shortly after Jesus is you know, crucified, resurrected, and ascended, the disciples have Pentecost Sunday, and then they very quickly need to choose others to help them. So they choose the seven deacons, of which Stephen is one. Within just a few months, Stephen is stoned. Paul is the one who is the aggressor for Stephen to be stoned. And then he is charged by the Sanhedrin to go out and, and basically stamp out this movement uh, about Jesus, you know, Christianity. So Paul has been there in Jerusalem during the whole time of Jesus' ministry, during the whole time of the trial and crucifixion, and resurrection, and ascension. He knows everything because he was there. This wasn't news to him. He didn't show up last minute and be put in charge. He was there already and is given this task. Charge, you mean he was charged, meaning he was given the task? Given the task okay. by the Sanhedrin okay. to eliminate Christianity. Okay? Uh, one of their zealous young pupils, as opposed to getting their hands dirty. Okay? So Paul is extremely zealous to go and do their bidding. Like and, he, and he believes, not a scapegoat because there's no consequences, he but he was zealous and ready to go do it. And they didn't have to mess with it because he could go do it. And yes. Meaning excited. Excited. Yes. So they wouldn't blame the Sanhedrin. They'll blame. Well, they're nobody's going to blame them anyway. Sanhedrin has the authority to do what Paul's doing. Wow. You know. So. All right. So. Uh, more about the date now. For I will not presume to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me, resulting in the obedience of the Gentiles by the word and deed. By word and deed and the power of signs and wonders, and the power of the Spirit, so that from Jerusalem and around about as far as I carry them, I say that, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ, and thus I aspire to preach the gospel not where Christ has already been named, so that I would not build on another man's foundation. So Paul is writing to the Romans, and basically he's saying that his work in Asia Minor and Greece, Turkey and Greece, are concluded. And he's looking for a new mission field, an untouched mission field, that he can go and preach the gospel. He doesn't want to come and pastor the church at Rome or do mission work there. You know, he wants to go someplace new where the gospel hasn't been presented. Okay? Now, that was uh, Romans 15, 18 to 20. Now, this is 15, 22 to 28. Okay? For this reason, I've often been prevented from coming to you. But now, with no further place for me in these regions, and since I have had for many years a longing to come to you, whenever I go to Spain, for I hope to see you in passing and be helped on my way there by you. Then, I have first, when I first enjoyed your company for a while, but now I'm going to Jerusalem serving the saints. For Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to make a contribution for the poor among the saints of Jerusalem. Yes, they were pleased to do so, and they were indebted to them. For if the Gentiles have shared in the spiritual things, they are indebted to minister to them also in material things. Therefore, when I have finished this, and have put my seal on this first fruits, 
this fruit of theirs, I will go by way of you to Spain. What's the difference between Gentiles and Christians? Nothing? Well, no, it's an ethnic. Jews, everyone's not Jews as Gentiles. Gentiles. Non-Jew. Okay? And the, the apostles at the beginning struggled with, was the gospel just for the Jews? Because Jesus is the Messiah, the fulfillment, the fulfillment of the covenant made with Abraham. Or was what he did also available to non-Jews, Gentiles? Uh, and remember, there's a great hatred between Jew and Jew, from the Jews toward the Gentiles. And, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Is all this in chapter 15? Huh? All this in chapter yeah. 15? Yeah, the previous verse was 15, 18 to 20. Oh, okay. And this is 15, 22 to 28. So, uh, Paul has the intent to go to Spain. And what lies between, you have Turkey, Achaia, Greece, Italy, and Spain. You've got to get through, through Italy, Rome, to go to Spain. So his plan is, he's taking the offering, and, and notice what he's talking about. From Jerusalem, from the Jews, has come the spiritual blessings, the message of the gospel of Jesus. It's been shared with the Gentiles. Okay? So the Gentiles have received the blessings, spiritual blessings from the Jews. So they need to share material blessings back to the Jews. There are suffering in Jerusalem because of the persecution uh, of, of many Christians are living in poverty. And the church, that's the reason they chose the seven deacons, is because they take care of the poor. So Paul is delivering money, offerings, that the churches in Turkey and Greece have collected to send back to <laughs> Jerusalem to help the poor people there. He's going to deliver the money to the leadership in Jerusalem and then head to Spain by way of Rome. Okay? So the journey to deliver the offerings to the saints of Jerusalem is referred to in Acts 20 and 21. Paul was determined to travel to Spain and open a new mission field. His plan was to travel through Rome on his way to Spain. The combined events of this, uh, of the combined events of the conclusion of the ministry in Greece and the journey to Jerusalem would put the approximate date at about 58 A.D. Jesus is crucified in roughly 27 A.D. So we're talking. Uh, 27 to 37 to 47 to 57. So about 30 years, Paul has, you know, 25 to 30 years, Paul has been ministering uh, in the whole area of Greece. And and you understand, you know, they spent an average of two years in every place they went. So he's been working in that area for a long time. He would have been like 50, 52. Well, his age was, 49. No, well, probably more in the 50s because he would have yeah. had this, he would have been about 30, like Jesus, before they entrusted the responsibility to him to go stamp out the church. We're about 30 years later, so he's in his 55 to 60 range. And he's heading to Spain. He's heading to Spain. He's heading to Spain. Right. <clears throat> okay. Paul references those who are with him as he writes this epistle. I think he person mentioned is Gaius. And then it'll be come up again in the in the in the actual letter of the Romans. Uh, Timothy, my fellow worker, greets you. Okay, Timothy becomes a young pastor. Okay. Uh, so do Lucius and Jason and Sospater. I would say the name, my kinsman. Does that mean they're related to him somehow? Or they're brothers in the faith? We don't know, but it sounds like this last one, Sospotator, may be actually related to Paul somehow. Okay? I, Tertius, who write this letter, greet you in the Lord. He's using a secretary. Paul is dictating it, and, and, and Tertius, I would say his name, is the secretary who's writing everything down, Paul's saying. Remember, Paul is almost blind, so he doesn't usually write his own letters. Okay. Almost blind, like he was given sight back from God. So he was blinded, blinded, yeah. yeah but it, but in old age, as he gets older, he's losing oh, his okay, eyesight. Okay. Just like, you know, I got older, I had to wear glasses. Well, you know, people typically when they get older need some bifocals. They didn't have them back then. 
Paul can't see to write. And at one point, it was the end of Roman to one of us, says, see what big letters I write to you. He's writing his final greeting himself, and he's having to use big letters to see what he's writing because he can't see. He can probably see you know, a mile down the road, but he can't see right here. Well, also, I don't think in the sort of generally thought that he had, <clears throat> what's that eye disease? That you have glaucoma. glaucoma. It could have been that. It could have been cataracts. I mean, who because knows? Of what, because of what, in one of the other epistles, he said, you would have teared out, torn out your own eyes and given them to me. Right. He can't see well enough to travel by himself. And so that's even, even. younger. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, Gaius, host to me and to the whole church, greets you. So where Paul's writing from, Gaius is the head of is hosting the church there, right? Erastus, the city treasurer, greets you. And Quartus, the brother. So he's listing all these people who are with him who are probably going to travel with him to Jerusalem to deliver the money, okay? Uh, the Gaius, which is known to us in the ministry of Paul, is from Corinth. I thank God that I baptize none of you except Christus and Gaius, so if Gaius is host to me right now, then Paul is probably riding from Corinth. Okay? Because he's at Gaius' house, and Gaius was baptized by Paul in Corinth. So about 58 AD, from Corinth, he writes the letter to the Romans, sends it, and he goes from Corinth, which is Greece, back to Jerusalem before he makes his journey to Rome. Paul also commends Phoebe to the church of Rome. She may very well have been the courier who delivered this epistle to the church. So you not only have Paul writing it, somebody's got to hand deliver it. They didn't have a U.S. Postal Service. So I commend to you our sister Phoebe, who is a servant of the church, which is, in, which is at Centria, that you receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints, and that you help her in whatever manner she may have need of you, for she herself has also been a help to helper of many and of myself as well. So the church at Centria is a reference to an area south of the city of Corinth. So again, a reference is probably coming from Corinth, and, and Phoebe is going to be the one who is there, and he's saying to the Roman church, help her. So she's going to be physically present there, probably the courier of the letter, the one who's delivering it to them. Now we get into a bunch of pictures. We may therefore conclude that Paul was in Greece and in or near the city of Corinth when he penned this epistle. You see Corinth, you know, Athens over here, Sparta, and Corinth. See that little wood line there? That's the Panama Canal <laughs> you know, in that day. Wow. Uh, the, really? the little line is, is that little isthmus, isthmus. They actually dredged it out. It was a pass-through so that trade going from east to west did not have to go south around, but could go through there. You know, the barges, you know, they had big ships. And so Corinth was a very wealthy trade center because of that. Located at Lismus, and, and traders would travel. They could travel along the coast you know, port to port and not go out in the deeper part of the sea and everything, and they could get through quickly to the other cities. Is that part of Italy? That's Greece. Greece, okay. Okay. The top of it's Greece. Okay. We'll, we'll, we'll see a bigger, well, we can go to a bigger picture real quick. We'll back up. All right. See, okay. Corinth is right here. Oh, okay. 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 So all that area is Greece, but Corinth is just that little a little piece of land that connects the two sections of Greece. All right. All right. So, Paul's first convert in Greece was Lydia, the seller of purple, a very wealthy person who made her living in the trade of purple material. Purple material was well sought after because it was a symbol of royalty. And how did you make purple material back then? Dye. No, they didn't have man-made dyes though. You had to harvest a little bitty clam out of the Mediterranean Sea and smush it, and it was inside its blood and stuff was like this purple color. 
and you would dye the material in the liquid that came out of these little clams. How many little bitty clams do you have to get yeah, to, to dye a piece of material? It was very expensive to make. Like saffron. And she was a seller of purple. I wonder if she's going to do that to the day. They may. All right. So. Oh, no. All right. Saffron today is $5,000 announced yeah. something like that so on the day of pentecost there were visitors present in jerusalem who were from rome so the day of pentecost you know, 10 days after the ascension of jesus in the listing in acts 2 phrygia and pamphylia egypt and the districts of libya and around cyrene and visitors from rome both jews and proselytes cretans and arabs we hear them in our own tongue speaking the mighty deeds of god now uh, proselytes were Gentiles who had converted to Judaism. Mm -hmm. Okay, so they were not ethnic Jews, but they were religious Jews. Okay, that's a proselyte. And so you have some Gentile speaking, and that, that was the whole thing about the temple. Temple Mound, if you recall, and I, I'll show you a picture of it some other time. You had the temple, the main building, then you had uh, the court of the priests, and then the court of the men, and then the court of the women. So you get further and further away from the temple. And then out at the outer edge, beyond the court of the women, there was this little fence on the temple mound with some gates and guards at each gate. And there was another, you know, a short wall, not a big wall, and little gates like you'd have in your backyard. And if a Gentile crossed through that gate, they could be executed. It was one of the one place, the one place that the Romans said, you can kill somebody with our permission and we don't have to be there. Remember, Jesus had to be taken to the Romans to be executed. If a Gentile tries to pass the gate from the court of the Gentiles to the court of the women and onto the court of men and court of priests, if a Gentile passes that gate, the Jewish guards can kill him on the spot without consequence from Rome because that was a sacred Jewish only area. So, Probably by their way of dress, their appearance, you, you know, the, you know, it, well, but I mean the, the facial tones okay. and stuff, you know, skin tone color and stuff, I'm assuming. You know, you could tell someone from Egypt as opposed to someone, someone who's a Jew. Um, but, so you had court of the priests, court of the men, court of the women, the fence, court of the Gentiles. Where did Jesus overturn the tables and turn the animals loose? In the court of the Gentiles. Because they didn't, the Jews didn't care if the Gentiles had all kinds of disruption while they're trying to worship. Well, who's on the Temple Mound that are Gentiles trying to worship? Proselytes. Those who accepted, accepted the Jewish God but aren't Jewish in their ethnicity. And Jesus gets mad because the Jews are making it hard for the Gentiles to worship God. That's why he overturned the money changers and set the animals free and flashed a cord of whip out of court and drove the people out. All right, so these travelers who were there for the day of Pentecost, who were, or even others who were just doing business there, they hear the message of the gospel and go home, including people from Rome. How did the church in Rome get started? What about an apostle? One of these travelers goes back home and says, hey, guess what I learned while I was gone? I learned about God and about the Savior of all humanity, and the church is started in Rome by someone who heard and became a Christian on Pentecost Sunday. And that's Catholic. No. no. Catholic Church doesn't come around to 580 AD. Okay. It's just the Christian church. Okay. Paul meets Aquila and Priscilla in Corinth. They were there because of the expulsion of the Jews from Rome. Aquila and Priscilla were Christians who had been part of the Church of Rome. Okay? After these things, he left Athens and went to Corinth. And he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontius, having recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. And he came to them. So Claudius, the emperor, banishes all the Jews. The Jews have never had an easy time in the world. No, it's always the Jews' fault. And so the Roman emperor banishes all the Jews. Where do they go? They just find another city to move to. And so Priscilla and Aquila, who, who, who play significant roles in the life of Paul, he meets in Corinth, 
and they're not Christians until they until they end up with Paul, but they are Jews, and they've escaped or left Rome, and end up in Corinth. And Paul meets them. They become Christians. They become a very influential part of the church. Rome is in the middle of Rome in the middle of the first century had a population of approximately eight hundred thousand people. That's a big city when you aren't any automobiles. Yeah. And where everything is built out of rock and stones and stuff. The population was dense and the development of suburb, of suburb areas had begun. Why did Nero get in such trouble? What was the thing about, the saying about Nero? He fiddled while Rome burned. burned. From what historians understand, Nero, Rome was kind of like Washington, D.C. or Detroit or Dallas. Everything starts at the center, where the Roman Senate, the Emperor's Palace, and things that, and grows outward. But as it grows outward, the, the things closest to center become decrepit and old. You know, it's the slums, and the suburbs are the nice areas. Well, Nero, in his nice Emperor's Palace, is around. There's slums all around. Kind of like today. So what does he want to do? He wants to rebuild it. So how do you do that? You burn it all down and start over. <laughs> So they set the fire to burn down the slums, the inner city part of Rome, and it got away from them. The fire did. And so who did he blame? Christians. He's a, he's a scapegoat. Rome is, a lot of Rome is burned, so Nero can rebuild it. And when the fire gets out of hand and they can't control it, he has to have somebody to blame, because he's not going to take the blame. Okay? So, Rome is host to many races, with a strong oriental element, among which the Jews were present as a marked influence, despised and sometimes dreaded, but always attracting curiosity. People didn't like the Jews. Why? Because they're different. They believe in only one God. What do the Romans believe? There's dozens of gods. They believe in sexual purity. What do the Romans believe? Yeah, boys, girls, men, women, whatever. They had, you know, Dietary restrictions. Romans ate what? Romans, Gentiles ate whatever. They were different, and we don't like different. Okay? Now, Paul lived and ministered under five different Roman emperors. That's a lot. Okay? I've never actually stopped to count how many presidents I've lived under. But, you know, we change them every four or eight years. They, this was, you know, you get the job till you die. And sometimes they hastened that death. <laughs> you know, people around them. Well, so we're from 63, so that's Kennedy on us. Yeah. So, Caesar Augustus is... Caesar Augustus was not originally called Augustus. He was Octavian. He was the nephew of Julius Caesar. When Caesar is executed... Or, or assassinated by Brutus and Cassius, Octavian fights with Mark Anthony and Cleopatra. You know the story, same era. Caesar dies. Mark Antony wants to be emperor. Octavian is the one that Julius Caesar willed the empire to. It is will. So he's named to be emperor. And there's some other generals. So they all fight. Anthony and Cleopatra die. Mark Antony dies and Cleopatra commits suicide. They're down in Egypt. Octavian secures his place as the new emperor and is hailed as Augustus, which is what? To be august is to be royal, to be epic, to be great. So he is the great Caesar, Caesar Augustus. His name is Octavian. Okay? He becomes uh, Caesar in 27 BC and rolls till 1480 when he dies and he is ruling while Jesus is born. Tiberius takes over after him for 14 to 37, he is the emperor while, when Jesus is crucified. Okay? Caligula is, you know, my note there, a crazy and insane emperor, 37 to 41. He didn't last very long. Okay? Claudius, 41 to 54, a little bit longer, good, sensible ruler who served the empire well. Nero, a narcissistic man who squandered the wealth of the empire and eventually committed suicide to avoid being murdered. 54 to 68. So what? 14 years? All right. So these are the, the 
the emperors in the life of Paul. Remember, we're at about 58 when he writes the letter to the Romans? So Nero is emperor. Dangerous time to live in the world. So there's Caesar Augustus. These are the actual statues and stuff that are left of him. Uh, not a bad looking guy. You see him younger, you see him older in the middle. This is Tiberius. Well, they were all in good shape, don't you think? Well, notice there's always artistic, <laughs> you know. Freedom. Yeah. Uh, Caligula. See, he does look insane. He so, looks like the youngest. Claudius. Nero. Probably younger and older. He, he obviously partied hardy. He got fat. Okay. Now, the Roman Empire in the first century, everything in red is the Roman Empire. I know, that's, a, that's amazing. It's amazing to me that Spain, Africa, Italy, Rome, Greece, Asia Minor, back, they, that was their names back then and still today. Yeah. So, um, and now you can stem off of Spain and you go a little bit further, you'd have Great Britain. You know, Rome went in there. They never did quite get all of Scotland and Ireland conquered. Uh, they tried, but they did secure Great Britain. There's a lot of Roman influence in London and places like that southern part. Uh, and, you know, the great centers of learning, uh, you don't see them on this map, but Alexandria, Egypt would be about here, Jerusalem, you know, uh, you know Corinth, those are, are the, the churches in Asia Minor be Ephesians, Galatians, you know, Philippians, all those over here. First Corinthians, you know, Corinthians is over here on the Ethmus, I think, Rome. You know, there are great centers of learning in the ancient world. I said Paul's, you know, uh, city grew up in Tarsus is long about right here. And that was known as a great center of learning, of culture. So the Romans, wherever they went, culture thrived just like they did before the Romans under, under Alexander the Great. So here's a, drawn out just a little bit differently there, you see Great Britain, and you see Hadrian's Wall up in the northern part, where well, they built a wall because they couldn't conquer the area, so finally they just walled it off the guards there, and so they couldn't be attacked. But they never could conquer the area. And uh, see Germania, was modern day Germany, they never did completely conquered the Germans because the Germans are too stubborn to ever give in. Yeah. Okay? So, you know, you see the expanse of the empire. And now a lot of these names are now have different names, correct? Some of them do. Germania, Germany, you know. So, but look here. The brown areas are what Caesar Augustus had. From the 14th when Caesar Augustus died all the way to the end of the, of the first century, only little areas were added. They wanted to expand the Roman Empire, but they kind of ran out of steam because what happened, <coughs> why did Rome fall? It wasn't because they didn't have military might. They were greedy. Because of the corruption from within. When you got guys like, like Nero who want to get drunk and have sex all the time and that's the sole purpose of their existence what does that do to the leadership of the nation what does it do when the leadership on down is corrupt and self-serving you 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 rot from within and that's what happened to rome okay. that's what's happening to us well there's a lot of correlation there so there's the coliseum what's left of it today you ever been there Benjamin? no not to rome Okay, and notice this is an artistic rendition, and they think the poles were it's for canopies for shade yeah. over the crowds. Okay, uh, what's interesting about the Colosseum is you go inside and look on the inside. There's we had a false floor, so they would they could flood it and have naval battles. Yeah, they uh, could you know have you know the floor move and like. Gladiators come up out of the floor to fight, or wild animals, or whatever. Okay, uh, posted around the edge, probably Greek gods, uh, heroes, whatever. I want to put around the edge. 
That's some massive buildings. Look at the size of the people under the yeah. archway there. And they built that without cranes, without bulldozers, without... Amazing. And we think we're so great. Those UFOs. <laughs> okay. Stonehenge. I mean, how do you, you know, think of the manpower needed to create, not only to build the columns, but to erect the columns. Like pyramids. Cement's been around a long they time. Had a, they had a study uh, in the university on trying to get one of those the way they think they did it, and they took over a hundred and some students, men students, to pull the ropes just to get one of those things lifted up. Mm -hmm. so I can imagine how many slaves it took to build that. Yeah. So look here at the, you know, this is for chariot races and stuff. Yeah. Racetrack. There's the Coliseum. What's this? Freshwater aqueduct. Oh yeah. Yeah. They had running water. They even had hot and cold running water. They figured out a way to heat water. Well, isn't it true that Rome was the first, basically civilized nation? Back then? No. Really? No. The the Babylonians, the Persians, uh, you know, even the Greek Empire and Alexander, they were very sophisticated in their day. Okay? They had laws, they had courts, they had, you know, school, they well, had I'm, I'm, I'm referencing to the uh, like the streets. The water and the running water and all that stuff. Right, they definitely improved. They took the other's ideas and built upon oh, okay. it and improved yeah. it. Yes, they definitely okay. did that. Okay. Now there's a statue of Constantine the Great. Now, granted, Constantine was a great emperor. You're jumping to the three hundreds. But look at the size they built. That guy standing beside a hand and look at the size of the head. That's what's left of the statue of Constantine. Constantine becomes emperor of the Holy, what's left of the Holy Roman Empire in 312. The, uh, the battle, the Bridge of Milan, the battle, he supposedly saw a vision in the sky and God said, go conquer under this sign. And he, it was a sign of the cross. And so he put a cross on all the shields and, and armor and stuff of the Romans. He was the first Christian emperor. He conquered. Uh, his enemies became emperor of the Holy Roman Empire and the first Christian emperor, 312. And he uh, is the one who calls the Council of Nicaea, uh, from which we get the Nicene Creed, to, as a Christian emperor, to put to rest the disputes over the identity of Jesus. Was Jesus a man or was Jesus God? And the Council of Nicaea clarifies that for the church. Therefore, rejecting... Uh, Arius and his teachings and followings of Jesus was only a man who was endowed with the Spirit of God. The church fell on the side under Constantine's leadership that Jesus was God who became a man. Was he the last emperor? What's your question? Just what you just said. Okay. The, the church had always taught that Jesus was the eternal Son of God who became a human being when he was conceived in the womb of the Virgin Mary and born. So he is fully God and fully man when he becomes a human being. Uh, Arius comes along in the late 200s up into the 300s and says, I don't believe that. I believe Jesus was just born a human being, regular mother and father, and at his baptism, the spirit of the second person of the Trinity came upon him and he was the Messiah. But when he went to the cross, the spirit of the second person of the Trinity left him and just a man died on the cross. Isn't that the truth? Or? No, that's the error. That's, okay. that's what Arius was teaching. Okay. And so at the Council of Nicaea, those who followed Arius presented their ideas. Those who held to what the church had always taught, that Jesus is the eternal Son of God who became a human being and God died on the cross, presented theirs, and Arius was condemned as a heretic, and the church held on to the truth that Jesus, the eternal second person of the Trinity, took on human flesh and the womb of the Virgin Mary, and as the God-man, suffered and died on the cross and rose again. What do you believe? That. That. The foundation of our church. I know, but... So what, I know, but what does Satan always attack? Yeah. 
the identity of Jesus and the gospel. Who Jesus is and what Jesus did. That's what Satan attacks. In that day and age, it was they, he, Satan was attacking who Jesus is. Because if you don't have the right Jesus, you don't have the right God. You don't have the right gospel. Okay? If Jesus is just a man and only a man died on the cross, the gospel is nothing. A man dying on the cross can't save you from your sins. Okay? So, Constantine was called Constantine the Great. Okay? Now, back up for a second. Way back. Uh, see here? Byzantinum. Modern day word. What was the old ancient name of that city? Constantinople. Why? Because in the 300s, here's Rome way over here. Constantine said, I want to be in the center of the empire as emperor. So he moves the capital of the Roman Empire here. Oh. So this becomes the capital of the Roman Empire in the 300s. Rome has forgotten about it. They don't like that. Okay? Constantine is a Christian. So you have Christians over here who say, hey, we finally have arrived. Our emperor's a Christian. What about us? And over here, the church is going like crazy because Constantine the emperor is there and he's a Christian. So there's this divide, east and west. Once you eventually, a couple hundred years later, have Roman Catholicism taking over here all through the empire, but there's still this divide. Who's the most important? The Patriarch of Rome or the Patriarch of Constantinople? The Pope or the Pope? You know, they call them Patriarchs. Which one is most important? It takes 500 years, or five, by 500 years, 1085. From 580 to 1085, the church splits east and west. Roman Catholic, Greek Orthodox. The center of the Roman Catholic Church is in Italy, in Rome. The center of the, Rome, of the Eastern Orthodox Church is in Constantinople. Patriarch of Constantinople heads over the whole Eastern Orthodox Church. The Pope heads over all the Western and the Catholic Church. Still like that today. 1085 is when they split. 500 years of arguing and fighting, they finally just said, okay, let's just go our separate ways. Let's be two kingdoms of God in the world instead of one. I sometimes find it hard to understand that. Like you said, 500 years, you know, that's like me growing up to be an old man and then my son keeps up the fight and his son keeps up the fight. And yep. Except it's, it's, it's all political. It's all about power. Remember, there, there are, you know, from, from that time, from the time the Roman Catholic Church started in 580 forward, they came up with all these teachings and didn't even hold to them. I mean, there's, there's stories of popes having children who they're supposed to be celibate and all this kind of stuff. And there was a chance, there was a time when, when Italy, uh, when Rome wasn't where the Pope was seated, the Pope was over in Spain, there were two Popes, three Popes at a time fighting with each other because different parts of the church would say, we want this person to be Pope, others would say, we want this person to be Pope, and they'd fight amongst themselves. That was happening too, after 1085. This is crazy, all right? Netflix is just weird all the beginning. All right, so there is a bar in Pompeii Go ahead and have a drink. Your Pompeii was consumed by the volcano, but yeah. then this is a bar. Is that what they found? Yeah, this, as they've done. D. Yeah. Wow. And look at the murals on the walls. Yeah. Okay. There is, you know. Your cast iron skillet. Yep. Cookware from that first century time period. Murals, not half bad in their ability to, to do it. And they survived, you know, 2,000 years. There is a Roman bath. Remember, it had warm water. That's a lot of naked men in there. There's another one. Nice. There's a Roman Senate that has survived to this day. The Romans also invented uh, concrete, which enabled them to construct buildings as never before in history. They also used their new discovery to create a road system throughout the empire, and there are the roads of the Roman Empire. That was on a, that was on a, a question on a game show I watched last week. Who created concrete? Mm -hmm. yeah. So notice, you know, we always talk about God's timing. 
Alexander the Great brings a universal language into the world. Doesn't matter whether you're Arab, whether you're Greek, whether you're Roman, whether you're a Spaniard, whether you're in Israel, whether you're in Egypt, everybody spoke Greek. It was the world language for trade, you know, for existence under Alexander the Great. But then it was kept on as kind of the trade language. Wherever you went, if you knew Greek, you could communicate with somebody. So it was the, it was the international trade language. Even though I was born in, in, you know, down here in Africa and spoke, or in Egypt and spoke Egyptian, I could go over here to Turkey where they spoke Turkish or whatever they speak, spoke then. But we both speak Greek because we're doing business with each other. Okay? So you have a universal language when Jesus is born. And Rome has been around since Julius, since Caesar, uh, Julius Caesar who's consolidated the Roman Empire, they've discovered concrete and they've built this road system. So not only does everybody speak the same language, they can travel quickly and easily. So we were bilingual. By, uh, most everybody spoke more than two languages. Do you know what the universal languages have? I have no idea. Probably Spanish. I read one time that it's Cantonese. Really? Yeah. So here's Israel, the roads passing, you know, going over to the to the west or to the east, like to Babylon and places, like they saw in Arabia. Here's all of the road systems in Turkey, the roads in Greece, look at the roads in Rome, Africa, over to Spain, over to Britain. Romans built all those roads. And, which, and that was all done by slaves. Yeah. And so when Jesus is crucified and Pentecost happens and everybody becomes Christians, and then the persecution happens, and the church Christians have to scatter, they can move from one place to another with great ease. They don't have to get on a ship and go across the Mediterranean. They can go over land easily because the Roman roads were also patrolled by Roman guards. There was security and safety in the empire to travel. So a huge road system and, uh, and a universal language set the stage for the gospel to spread through the known world rapidly. And it did. Sure. That is the end of that section on the introduction. And right on cue, we're out of time. Yeah.